This morning I want to share a text out of Matthew chapter 16. So if you're with me in a Bible or an app or something to that effect, join with me in Matthew chapter 16. The last two Sundays we've talked about Martin Luther and what Martin Luther meant to modern day Christianity and how it, it kind of changed the trajectory of, of Christianity in the world, in fact. And this morning I want to, and, and kind of the emphasis he placed and said we need to redirect our thinking about what we're focusing on in the life of the church. And so I want to take us to a text today is, is actually, you know, what in the church is called Reformation Sunday. It's the Sunday prior to the 31st, so on and so forth. But I want to take us to a text where Jesus kind of biblically stated for us what Martin Luther retold us and that we, need to, that we needed to focus in on. So if you're in Matthew chapter 16, I'm going to begin reading in verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the, of, of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, and on the third day he ra be raised from the dead. So he's getting toward the end of his ministry. He is predicting his death, is what he's doing. He's, he's predicting his death. He's, he's telling his disciples this. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. You know, I've read this text many times, and uh, every time I can't get past that... Um, I don't know how you feel about yourself and your relationship to the Lord, um, but I'm just telling you, I'm not in the place where I would rebuke Jesus. I'm just not there. I, I, I got a long way to go before I would rebuke Jesus. And I think a lot of times we look at Peter, and we it, Peter's an interesting study, by the way. He really is. And if you have spare time, study Peter, because um, he can teach us a lot. But he was the very outspoken and he was very boisterous, and he was very opinionated, and all that kind of thing, and, and yet he, he, he rebuked Jesus. That's kind of interesting, and I, I just, I'm amazed every time I read that. He took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Okay, so he was self-centered. He was ego-centered. That's going to come into play in the message. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must do three things. Deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Deny, take up, follow. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life from me will find it. What good will it be for a man... If he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul. Or what can a man give in exchange for a soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels. And then he will reward each person according to what he has done. I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. When we mention snow in Alabama, it causes panic and pandemonium. Uh, the mention of snow sends us all to the grocery store wherever we go, and we get hysterical. We grab um, much more stuff than we could ever possibly use in the amount of time that the snow is going to be on the ground past one or two or three, you know, once every other generation of snow uh, we might have. But most often the, the chaos that is created is um, is massive, and most of the time it's it's not necessary, right? It's you you end up after day two and you've got six loaves of bread and you don't know what to do with it, or you've got three gallons of milk and it's like, what good is milk? You ever thought about that? I'm going to get bread and milk from the grocery store for snow, and most likely your your electricity is going to go out. What are you going to do with that milk? Set it outside and hope the dogs don't come lick it up and you know all that kind of stuff. So it's kind of a weird thing we do. Look, I'm going for sweet tea that will be okay you know, at room temperature, and, you know, I'm going for chocolate candy. It's not going anywhere. So it, chocolate candy does not mold, by the way. You can have, look, you, you go get, you go steal all your kids' Halloween candy this, in, in this Halloween. N next Halloween, you can open it up, and it's not going to be molded. It might be a little white and crusty, but it's not going to hurt you to eat it, right? Are you tracking with me? Absolutely. 
I know how that works. So anyway, um, but I want to introduce you to a new snow this morning. It's not, I'm not going to introduce you. I want to remind you of a new snow this morning. And it's kind of a, the modern day phrase. Like 20, 25 years ago, the cool thing to do was to make a statement and then have a little pregnant pause and say not. You know, like, you know, how yeah, that people used to do 20, 25 years ago. It was made famous in a movie. And now the cool thing to do is to make a statement and then have that pregnant pause and say, said no one ever. Snow, S-N-O-E, right? Said no one ever. And you've got your favorite little cartoon you might have seen. And so I wrote a few of them down this morning. Uh, you know, now we say this, said no one ever. It's things like, I love the sound of my alarm clock, said no one ever. Monday is my favorite day of the week, said no one ever. Um, I look forward to going to Walmart, said no one ever. Especially on the third of the month. Oh, my goodness gracious. Or, look, Lori went Friday, and she said, it is crazy here today. And I said, look, you've got to remember that on Fridays, there's a lot of people in this town that get paid every Friday. Every business that pays weekly on Friday, those people, they, they're there, and they all go shop. No, actually, she was at the gas station. Yeah, that, she was having to wait at the gas station. I said, and they all go gas. So, Fridays, third of the month, no one ever. I love how my thighs look when I sit down wearing shorts. Said no one ever. Said no one ever. Now look, I think everybody in here, some of you, some of you like that more than others, right? Um, this one, I think, this one, look, I made Dustin mad. He's leaving. I'm sorry. Um, this one, I think we may, every one of us have been there before. One Girl Scout thin mint cookie is enough for now, said no one ever. No, I like six or eight or ten, yeah. And then, uh, and then a few specific ones. I guess it's time to clean my room, said no teenager ever. <laughs> yeah. Um, looks like you've been flossing your teeth too much, said no dentist ever. And then here's, here's a real one, and, and just... I think for those of you who text, okay, so if you don't text, then this may not mean a whole lot to you. But if you're, if you're a text messenger, if you text message, this one will have meaning. I love it when you text me first, I reply, then you don't respond, said no one ever. <laughs> Jesus changes the narrative of the disciples and the trajectory of their life in verses 24 and 25. These verses give rise to three principles which I believe are critical to being a disciple, yet very difficult to live by, and very rarely, if ever said. Now, for the sake of introduction, the introduction, I'm going to state them in a said-no-one-ever fashion. So in verses 24 and 25, Jesus says something like this. Or we might say in response to Jesus' words in 24 and 25. Number one, I would love to live a life of self-denial. Said no one ever. No one really wants to live a life of self-denial. But Jesus said... If anyone would come after me, if anyone wants to follow me, if anyone wants to be my disciple, if anybody wants to claim to be a Christian, if anybody wants to embrace the principles and the benefits and the rewards of Christianity, here's what we must do. We must live a life of self-denial. And no one, I want to say almost no one, is falling in love and stating, I want to live a life of self-denial. Why? Because it makes us change the natural human tendency to be me-centered. We live in a me-centered society. We have me rules. We have me goals. We have me dreams. We have me plans. We have me money. 
We have all these me things, me toys and me gadgets because our world is centered around me in the natural. And what Jesus is saying is, is that if we're going to follow after him, he changes the perspective so that you become you-centered. It's not only, it's not about me any longer, it's about you. It's not about my desire, it's not about me and all my plans and everything I have, it's about you, where what you need comes first. When where you are comes first, your needs are paramount. You are cared for, you are honored and respected, you are whole and healthy. And see, and that changes, that changes our very thinking. It changes the way we, um, we understand. It changes our, present, our perspective from being egocentric to being other-centric. And you've heard that stated in, in many different ways, but, you know, the reality is, is that following Christ, you know, was... Um, the model of following Christ is who? It's Christ Jesus. And he lived a life of being other-centered. He lived a life, his entire purpose was not about him. It was about you and me. The life Jesus lived was about you and me so that we could have life and have it more abundantly. It was not about so that he could be so that the focus would be on Him. You know, one of the things that probably, you know, if Jesus in His total humanity, He would have never said, I'm looking forward to going to the cross. You know, the reality is, is on the way to the cross, He shared a little consternation about that along the way. His life was not about Himself. If His life would have been about Himself, He would have withdrawn from people, and He wouldn't have been ganged on all the time. He wouldn't have spent all of his time healing and delivering and teaching and forgiving all the time. He would have said, I'm just going to make myself comfortable until I fulfill my purpose, which I'm not really excited about in the first place. But it is my purpose. And in my perfection, I'm going to the cross. You see, he lived a life with others as the central focus. Now, that's not to preclude that, that we don't take care of our own needs and we're not mindful of our life so that we live our life productively. And in, in a correct, I mean, we, we, you, there's certain things that you have to do, but you have to change your perspective from being egocentric to being other-centric. He says, deny yourself. Deny yourself. And when, that, when we're able to live life and, and along the way, we, we come to places where the needs, the desires of others become more important than mine. That's what self-denial is. It's not harming yourself. It's not putting yourself in a position to, um, you know, do any harm or destroy or mess up your family or any of that. It's having a perspective that says, I see you. I, I'm trying to understand you. And when I discover your need, then that's going to become important to me. That's what self-denial is. So he said, if you, want to, if you want to follow me, you must deny yourself. And secondly, take up his cross. And I, I state it this way. I can't wait to take up my cross. Said no one ever. I can't wait to take up my cross. Said no one ever. You say, well, Alan, that's, that's a tough one. And I, I realize it is. It is, it is hard. What does it mean to take up your cross? What is your cross this morning? Because that, that's what's at stake here. 
Because there's nobody in this room, me included, that believes we're supposed to die on a cross like Jesus did. It's very clear in Scripture that His death on that cross was once and for all and was a finished work on the cross. So dying on a cross is not necessary. And at the very same time, Jesus said, Take up your cross. So what does that mean? What is your cross today? And here's how I say that. Your cross is anything, anything you know to be a biblical principle that you find difficult to adhere to. And those areas in your life where, which make self-denial difficult. Now let me repeat that. Your cross is anything you know to be a biblical principle that you find difficult to adhere to. And those areas of your life which make self-denial difficult. That's your cross. Your cross are those areas where you have difficulty living out what Jesus taught. Your, your cross are those areas where Paul spoke words, or Peter spoke words, or Matthew, Luke wrote words that are difficult for you to adhere to. Or those places in your life where self-denial becomes impossible. So let me give you a few examples. Do you have a hard time loving or befriending someone? A stranger. You may not know them. Is it difficult for you to open up your space... And show them the love of God. Or is your space and your circle a closed circle? And you're going to love a certain group of people. You're going to show them the love of Christ. You're going to unconditionally love just a certain group of people. Or is your life such that your space can be open? And you can embrace new people in some way. That may be your cross. Is it difficult for you to financially support the church generously? Is it difficult for you to financially support the church generously? Is it difficult for you to give in financially to other nonprofits or to people that are in need generously? If that's difficult for you, that may be your cross. It may be your cross if you think, well, everybody else in the church can support what we're doing. Everybody else can pay the utility bill. Everybody else can buy the curriculum. Everybody else can pay for the youth ministry. Everybody else can pay for the children's ministry. Everybody else can. I'm good. I, they don't need my money. If that's difficult for you, if you, you know, if you squirmed a little bit, if you said, wait a minute, Alan, that's a little bit personal. It's personal because that's what discipleship means. Discipleship means that you look at the holistic piece of your life and every one of us have control of some amount of finances and are we pouring that back into the church like the Bible says we're supposed to? Or is it, it just difficult for us and we don't want to do that? That may be your cross. Is it hard to love your enemies? If it's hard to love your enemies, then that may be your cross. And I could go on and on. There's lots of biblical principles that we could speak of. There's lots of teaching in the Bible that's hard, very difficult 
for me on a, very, on a daily basis, it's very difficult. Those become your crosses. And he says, pick those up. And he says, pick those up and take them with you. And follow me. And then he says, deny yourself. If anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will find it. Following Jesus is easy, said no one ever. Oh, there's a lot of people that say, I want to follow Jesus. Everybody says that, I want to follow Jesus. But my contention is, is that they say that, and they think that, and they believe that, and they want to do that before they've considered the self-denial and the cross. They hadn't considered all of what it means to follow Jesus. And so we say, I would love to follow Jesus. But they've never considered the cost of following. They've never considered how difficult it is to really follow Jesus. Because what Jesus plainly says in the text is that we cannot follow without denying ourselves and taking up a cross. And so we have to figure that piece out. What does it mean for Alan? What does it mean for Steve? What does it mean for everybody in here to take up a cross in terms of self-denial? What does that mean? We have to struggle with that. We have to understand that. We have to live that. Because we just cannot follow Jesus without those other two pieces. He didn't say this is multiple choice sentence I'm about to make. Listen to this sentence. If you want to follow me, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now choose multiple choice, A, B, or C. And most all of us would choose C and think we have the correct answer. But it doesn't work that way. We don't get lifelines. We don't get to phone a friend, any of those things. We have to choose A, B, and C. It's all one statement. He doesn't say, hey, pick and choose what makes you feel good. And that sounds kind of like us, right? He doesn't say that, but that's what we want to do. We want to pick and choose what makes us feel good. He says, no. We cannot follow without denying self and taking him across. That would be like being a Green Bay Packers fan and unwilling to, to wear that cheese head. You know, it, 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 would, it, would, it would be like being an Auburn fan and being unwilling to wear blue and orange to the football game. Or an Alabama fan and being unwilling to wear red and white to the football game. You know, you can't declare one thing and be unwilling to do the other. And if we're going to, be decla if we're going to declare ourselves as following Jesus, then the Bible says is that we must deny ourselves And we must take up our cross. It's adhering to His principles and His agenda. It's not creating our own agenda and trying to fit the Bible into it. There's a theological term for that. There's a theological term for creating our agenda and trying to make the Bible match it. Anybody want to take a wild guess at what that is? You can't guess, so don't try. Or maybe you could. It's called ISO Jesus. E-I-S-O-G-E-S-I-S. -E it's flipping the interpretation of the Bible in order to meet your interpretation and your agenda. And we can't do that. And I'm not here to say that it's easy. That's not my point this morning. My point is, is to tell you that it's very difficult. But with that difficulty comes meaning in your life. 
And if you're searching this morning for some meaning in your life, most likely you haven't made it past the self-denial phase yet. And you hadn't discovered what it means to take up your cross and deal with the difficult places of your life which for some reason don't line up with what you think the Bible says for your life, but it's a solid rock principle of Scripture and it's hard for you and that's where meaning would come in your life. And then it's rewarding. And Jesus said that. And it doesn't matter if any of us are saying it. It doesn't matter if everybody in the room is saying it. It says, He said it. For the Son of Man is going to come in His Father's glory with His angels, and then He will reward each person. With meaning comes reward. And it's not easy. It's not easy. But when we struggle and we deal with that which is about self-denial and cross-bearing, then we can follow. Then we find meaning. And then Jesus rewards. Let's pray together. Father, help us all to discover your truth in our life. Help us all to discover the power of the gospel in us. That we might turn inside out in self-denial. That we might discover the crosses that we need to carry, the crosses that we need to bear, the crosses that keep us from being in perfect relationship with you. And then follow then, Lord, walk after you, follow you in every way. So move in this place today in people's hearts, I pray, oh God. Move powerfully in hearts. In Christ's name I pray.